This special is my gift to my viewers. A complete expose of everything I have discovered, from every aspect of my work. A full explanation of an ancient past stolen from us all. Why it was stolen. How this has been achieved. Why this lie continues in the face of overwhelming evidence. And how, if the reasons are not exposed, our species is possibly destined for another cataclysmic experience. I hope you enjoy the great effort I have put into this special. Not only challenging understandings, but ultimately is a contribution, no matter how small, in freeing our civilization from those currently stalling its development. Ever since being introduced to the ancient world, I have been fascinated by the mystery of its origins. A fascination which would lead to discovering a past hidden from us all. As a young child, ancient wonders utterly fascinated me. I developed an insatiable appetite for information surrounding their existence. An appetite never quenched by school or the many books I would plow through in search for answers. Incredible feats of engineering seemingly ignored by everyone around me. I would share my findings with teachers and friends, yet they had either never noticed them, never thought about them, or were simply disinterested. Yet to me, they felt like mysteries of incredible importance. From a very young age, I had established that not only was Cheops the biggest mystery on Earth, but the only pyramid with chambers, eight sides, and was completely unexplained. My desire for answers would create constant frustration. Why were my teachers unable to tell me how they were built? Yet telling me they were the work of ancient Egyptians. An explanation that 25 years later is still being taught as a fact, with many students never giving it a second thought. Over the years, my hunger for answers grew, along with my awareness of many other ancient sites suffering from a similarly illogical explanation. Why were teachers all over the world teaching children fallacies instead of fascinating, inspiring mysteries? As I got older, my resentment of schools, historians, and academics alike slowly transformed into a hatred a hatred founded within their dishonesty, a group complicit in robbing generation after generation of historical truths, intellectual robbery designed to discourage the pursuit of ancient mystery, explaining ancient sites as the work of those incapable of such feats, results in them often being overlooked by inquisitive minds. Historians, teachers, and academics alike are nothing more than funded regurgitators of lies. Individuals who teach from textbooks permitted by their funders. The truth, however, is that there does exist an incredible reality regarding history, its ancient ruins, and the origins of our species. The fact that it's been hidden means that someone doesn't want us exploring it. I have experienced many difficulties during my pursuit of this hidden past attacks by religious groups, evolutionists, academics, historians, geologists, among many others. Hostilities driven by the control of money. People go to great effort to stem the flow of historical truths, the reasons for which I intend to expose within this special. The curriculum is undoubtedly their most powerful tool of deception, second only to their financial influence. Textbook teachers are commanded to teach from, reviewed, approved, published, and provided by a group of individuals who control human understandings. Mundane, incomplete information which students are tested on, forcing their young minds into retaining such falsities, conditioning us into believing fallacies from a very young age, concealing many things about human history, and nipping the curiosity for such mysteries in the proverbial bud. Mundane subject matter selected, subsequently resulting in a lack of interest towards history, all done by design. The status quo generates tremendous consistent profit flows. 
gobbled up by those controlling current affairs. These individuals have vested interests in resisting change, the suppression of information, perceived as threats to their power of influence. With one of the best ways to do this, controlling the information taught to children. Also, controlling any institution which could potentially create economic shifts. Funding institutions such as museums, universities, scientific corporations and many others who all play a role in the preservation of current understandings. The abuse of positions of trust is all around. Honest and talented scientists, archaeologists and geologists who have discovered many things, which would jeopardize this current state of affairs, have for many decades been denied publication, lost funding, and often their entire careers. Yet individuals who have presented scientific assumptions, which at their core ultimately stifle hope and thus a passion for change, are not only preserved, protected, published, but continually promoted well after their creator's death. Enter Darwin. Although not essential to the theory, most Darwinians are conveniently atheists. The reason for its popularity is due to a number of factors. Its chronology. Darwinism is a co-conspirator in the concealment of antediluvian history. It also insinuates there is no purpose for life. It's in direct opposition to other belief systems, which were all in conflict with each other ideologically already. And although opposed to our own research, unlike Charles ever could, we can provide vast demonstrative evidence supporting our assertions. Salts left on and ruins by extremely ancient seas, independent carbon datings, stratus locations of artifacts, impossible engineering, and so on. Additionally, due to a lack of requirement for a creator, Darwinism is by definition a cult. Yet structurally, literally inseparable from a religion, for just like religious beliefs, a leap of faith is required. The asserted evolutionary leap from apes is, in actuality, a belief rather than a fact. Regardless of those who aggressively argue it is true, it is absent evidence. Known as the missing link, or more specifically links, evolution requires faith in their existence as regardless of claims and rumors, they have never materialized. Additionally, regardless of our claimed ancestral proximity to apes, the human species is capable of an unimaginably larger set of abilities. For example, the capacity to look at the world, and indeed the universe around us, with such a drastically greater perception, we realize its undeniable complexity and fine-tuning. Let's take a look at an opposing theory for genetic similarities, merely to expose the theory of evolution's vagarity. DNA similarities with primates may not be due to natural selection, but instead due to a creator's methods of creation. Genetic similarities of differing vertebrates anatomies created using the tools of a creator. Like an artist painting on a canvas, his paint representing DNA, with his brush, his tool. Although paintings would be created using the same paints, the subjects depicted would only be limited by his imagination. Therefore, every one of his paintings would share a common feature, the paint. And although I present this theory to merely demonstrate an alternative DNA hypothesis, it is also supported by the living world. For if artistically created using the same materials, a reason for why we share a 50% DNA similarity with bananas would be a lot easier to explain than any evolutionist would ever find it. Additionally, some of our closest supposed ancestors, the great apes, are still around. Yet their transformation into humans, or similarly advanced subsets, seems to have ceased. Why? Regardless of how clever we may appear, especially compared to an ape, we are often wrong about things, simply because we choose to believe assumptions rather than prove them through demonstration. Religions, including Darwinism, prime examples of this. It is undeniable that throughout history, 
Impressive diversity has developed within vertebrate groups, ranging from whales to elephants. It is undeniable that there exists evidence of incredible variety and adaptability throughout the animal kingdom, avoiding extinction by doing so. Often commanded of them due to changing environmental factors. And yet, evidence for Darwin's evolution, specifically pertaining to his hijacking of the definition, to the leap from ape to man, or the leap from vertebrate type to another, regardless of its clearly funded popularity, ironically making Darwinism popular by design, is still absent any evidence. The theory requires a religion-esque leap of faith to believe it as true. The definition of evolution has been deliberately manipulated and altered within the minds of many. And this alteration of definition within the public domain has occurred before. Newton's laws, particularly his third, once largely studied as cause and effect, which Newton concluded, presumably after much thought and deliberation, was a compelling proof of intelligent design, has been slowly distanced from the theory by modern physicists and their mathematical obsession. Hijacking the definition with an intention that we suspect, like Darwinism's funded popularity, to distance our understandings from creation theory in favor of oblivion, offering nothing other than a lack of meaning for life. Is it mere coincidence that people with no perceived purpose are more easily controlled? But I digress. Astonishing adaptations within the different vertebrate sets has been observed, studied, and cataloged for years. Yet Darwinian evolution is clearly the argument surrounding ape to man, or vertebrate to vertebrate, both absent any observable or, more crucially, evidence supporting its validity. Ancient simian subspecies rolled out in a desperate attempt to prove its theory a collection of primate skulls lined up in a row, going from least like ours to most visually similar. This being Darwinian's strongest argument. We believe the evidence suggests Darwinian evolution's missing links are missing for a very good reason. We simply are not apes. Yet attempts to muddy the waters continue, calling different subsets of animals different species. We believe, however, Calling them different species is just another attempt to confuse the truth. They will always belong to their particular branch of animal. For example, a fish, a fish, a cat, a cat, a dog, a dog, regardless of the variations in breed. The limits of genetic alterations, indeed known as science, though rarely shared, they have been reached during breeding programs throughout history demonstrating genetic limitations and Darwinism as fallacy. Yet the theory continues to be pushed, solely to conceal a past prior to its asserted occurrence of man. By being ruthlessly logical in regard to one's own introspection, willing to admit when mistaken regarding a belief system, one enables inner growth. Religious belief, for example, is finite. It relinquishes the follower of the pursuit of answers to our existence. It is okay to understand religions, but without evidence, it's a mistake to claim them as true. We all have faith, a belief in things that we as individuals cannot prove yet usually desire to prove eventually. It is a form of trust, interconnected with the essence of human desires for discovery, ingrained within a natural desire to decipher the mechanics of the universe. However, this characteristic of human nature, potentially offering profound direction, has been exploited for thousands of years. People desire answers, and many of them, predictably, become deceived by others who pose as the possessors of them, seemingly offering those in pursuit of particular answers comforting lies in return for their loyal devotion. These primitively written religions and their established followings 
are preserved for the purposes of resisting change, controlling behavior, and preserving power dynamics. Yet the most important aspect, again, due to chronology, for most attest to a creation story, far after the existence of the lost civilization we cover upon our channel. Those who control the past inevitably control the future, for he who controls it is obviously in control of the present to enable its acquirement. This exclusive access to knowledge allows for them to unravel which factors would jeopardize one's continued control and which assist their preservation of power. In conclusion, the status quo we find ourselves in can thusly be deduced to be the result of these people's selection of what should remain concealed. Ultimately, driven by a desire of control over the world, keeping things how they are, with a seemingly bottomless well of funding this control produces, securing their power structure. One can therefore deduce that things are the way they are because it is exactly how they want them to be. The next step in understanding the situation is observing the status quo itself. The reality created by this controlling groups many nefarious methods of preserving human understandings. Deciphering the mechanisms implemented to resist change, protecting their highly profitable avenues of control. A concoction of old and new misdirections, ancient belief systems, each opposed to each other in different ways. The result of which being divide and conquer. Different pieces in a game of control, all selected for their characteristics of deception that although functioning as divisive faculties, are all connected in serving a united purpose, an ultimate concealment of a single truth. Thus, a connection between them all can be made if one looks hard enough. A common characteristic responsible for their intentional preservation within the status quo. This connection clearly being their claims regarding the age of Earth or man. All of which, in direct opposition of lost civilization, a far older timeline for the history of man. The lost civilization, the true history of Earth, protected and concealed by all the religions, theories, academics, and institutions in unison. This defining functionality strongly indicate that our research is indeed the hidden piece of the puzzle. Academic institutions, once a flourishing sector of society, now nothing but a dead horse. Annually fed eager individuals who throughout their long journeys to their dream jobs sacrifice their freedom of opinion. The strategy which is used to produce this vastly incomplete academic view of antiquity is the methodical process by which these institutes select scholars selected due to their willingness to regurgitate that which they are taught, with an end mechanism in place, preventing controversial publications reaching the public domain. For example, if a scholar covers a site adorned with remarkable, unexplained features, producing a report reflecting these controversial observations, they will firstly be notified that they are mistaken, and kindly asked to repeat their research given advice on how to produce a more tailored opinion. However, if they refuse, their findings are rejected, their work perceived incompetent, and their funded opportunities subsequently drying up, ultimately ending their young career. Academic funding being the beating heart of the dating conspiracy, with many a noble researcher losing funding and ultimately their careers as a result of refusing to change their research. Parallel to this, the reputable individuals, publicly perceived as official sources, are, in reality, obedient servants, controlled via the fear of losing their highly paid vocations along with its reputation. Eventually placed in positions of control, magazine editors, lucrative book publishers, and writers of the curriculum. 
these officially accepted, extremely popular, and highly funded publications are the proverbial Goliath to our David, the gatekeepers of adult historical inquisition, who en masse ignore the unexplainable. Due to this seemingly widespread willingness found within our own society to sell one's honesty in favor of financial gain, power, public influence, and positions of authority, have we also become a lost civilization as a result? Regardless of this widespread orchestrated dishonesty, and in defiance of those in control of this concealment, I have still achieved the gathering and compiling of an astonishing array of evidence surrounding many concealed ancient structures and their original builders. This success, regardless of those who are funded to ignore, deny, and dismiss their existence, I will now attempt to fully explain what I've discovered so far. The evidence which I have revealed creating a picture of antiquity using many pieces of a hidden puzzle found all over the globe. Though I do not wish to sound arrogant, the fact remains I have single-handedly discovered many aspects of the ancient world and connections between its sites no one had seemingly realized before me. I have established, beyond doubt, that we are at least the third civilization to have flourished here on Earth, a truth recently established. It's the result of over two years of exhausting exploration of antiquity, with the subsequent evidence of which I will now present. Established from the vast array of worldwide ruins, identified as possessing undeniable differentiations in their constructions, I have also independently compiled a list of equally undeniable similarities. Two separate styles found within the construction of Earth's ruins which we can now visually prove, were the work of two separate, world-going civilizations, with this being the first detailed exposé ever established of its kind. I have also identified which civilization built what, and also identified which civilization predated which. Earlier on, we discussed the hijacking of definitions, with the intention to confuse and conceal a strategy also found within the world of unexplainable ancient ruins. Due to the fact that these ancient civilizations built structures worldwide, in some locations their work overlaps, one being Aswan Quarry, yet the other, which is actively clouded by definition convolution, is Italy. During our research identifying these two ancient groups, I named them in relation to their differentiations particularly the techniques used to build their civilizations, named the Cyclopean Civilization and the Polygonal Civilization. However, the official definition of these terms have conveniently been muddied, conveniently making them hard to distinguish. Cyclopean is accepted academically, and thus by the majority of the public, as roughly cut stones precisely placed together with no use of mortar. Polygonal is accepted as being constructed of polygonal masonry, which according to said definers, requires the use of stones in the shape of polygons. However, the difference between these two styles are vastly different to this. Much of antediluvian Italy contains both cyclopean and polygonal ruins, yet conveniently, most are misidentified often described as cyclopean, yet many of these ruins are actually polygonal. Although the name polygonal is inspired by the use of stones of a polygonal shape, it is simply not the case, not being an exclusive feature of this type of masonry. Just like cyclopean walls were most likely not built by a cyclops. According to our own research, the most notable features which can be used to differentiate these two different civilizations is that polygonal masonry is unquestionably more advanced in method. Importantly, one can observe cyclopean ruins and often decipher how such ruins were constructed, 
This due to the use of stones, commonly of a cuboid shape, that although masterfully placed together, would be possible to replicate with great care and attention. Alternatively, polygonal masonry is reminiscent of a giant jigsaw puzzle, differing from cyclopean masonry in the fact that, firstly, it is created using randomly shaped stones, and most importantly, this type of masonry is still unexplainable due to its complexity. Furthermore, and perhaps crucially, due to these two civilizations' work overlapping within ancient Italy, Cyclopean masonry is found in numerous places, with polygonal built atop, these vital locations providing proof of which technique was built first, thus identifying which civilization's work predates which. Furthermore, there are other features found within these separate styles of masonry that proves they are indeed the work of two different civilizations, rather than an advancement in techniques by one. Initially discovered by New Earth YouTube channel, a unique identifiable block shape linked Jurash to Nimrod, these used by those who we have identified as the Cyclopean civilization. However, I have followed up on this connection extensively and it has been found to be an extremely important feature in the differentiation of these two lost civilizations. This identifiable signature, found upon many blocks amongst Cyclopean buildings, yet not within the polygonal civilization's buildings, found littering many ancient ruins throughout the Mediterranean, Crimea, Jerusalem, and the surrounding ancient areas, Greece, and so on, it is a feature completely absent from the ancient sites of Peru or any other exclusively polygonal ruin. Once we had identified this type of building block, we were then able to link them to the ancient tool marks found within Bazda Cave. This link, thanks to the confirmation that the cave was used as the quarry to create Haran, an ancient site nearby built with these identifiable cyclopean stones. Crucially, this link between quarry and stonework, allowed through the identification of tool marks left by technologies used to extract the stone to ruins in China, Petra, India, and many others all over the world, including Aswan Quarry, with the unfinished obelisk displaying their tool marks. Aswan, like Italy, is seemingly another location where these civilizations overlapped. We know this due to another feature, exclusive to one of these civilizations, which is another differentiation between civilizations, that being the polygonal civilization's use of protuberances. Mysterious notches that, like the signature cyclopean blocks, is exclusive to the polygonal civilization's ruins, making them another compounding feature undeniably enabling the identification and separation of these two ancient civilizations. Interestingly, we have in the past explored the intriguing differences between the ages of the casting stones upon the Great Pyramids, ultimately concluding that the different forms of casting stones were the work of separate civilizations, presumably conservation efforts. A posit now supported by our many other discoveries, and the fact that the youngest casting stones, possessing the polygonal civilization's protuberances, is another supporting piece of evidence, indicating they were a younger civilization than that of the Cyclopeans. Yet regardless of activities on the pyramid, due to the matching tool marks on the unfinished obelisk, the Cyclopeans were the ones attempting to liberate and erect the obelisk, maybe as a tribute to these structures.
and as previously mentioned, I identified cyclopean rock-cutting technologies via scars left within Bosda Caves, linking many sites all over the place, including Aswan. Yet in areas which solely contain polygonal ruins, such as Sacsayhuaman, I can now identify tool marks left upon that stonework and throughout Peru, which is visually identifiable as a different technology. Although Cyclopean stone-cutting technologies marks preserved in Bazda Cave, Longyu Cave, Yangshan Quarry, temples in India, Baalbek, and indeed at Aswan, seemingly appears to have been some form of incredible capable carving technology. However, Peru, Pamapunco, etc., contain tool marks, or rather scorched scars left upon the stones, which seemingly appear to have been vaporized. Additionally, the polygonal civilization's technology has left marks of a far more linear shape, as if cut by laser. Although our research, separating these civilizations, is in its early days, the fact that incredibly advanced ruins found in different areas of Earth possess a number of separating sets of identifiable or indeed differentiating features makes the fact that they were built by vastly different methods undeniable, overwhelming proof of multiple lost civilizations. And it seems, the more we study them, the stronger this evidence becomes. With their difference in ages located in places where they overlap, with the polygonal's building techniques constructed upon undoubtedly older cyclopean workmanship, I feel I am successfully unraveling a history hidden by a global conspiracy, whose mechanisms are grounded within money, power, and the sources of these revenue flows. And although I feel our release of this special is highly controversial, and possibly dangerous to their profit margins and subsequent mechanisms of control. I feel an obligation to share these understandings with all of you, as you have helped me achieve a success I never imagined possible, allowing me to share my message and indeed fight for the truth far and wide. You all chose to support my channel and its work in a battle against fallacies which have robbed us of our true heritage. And ultimately, regardless of the risk of these exposures, I feel it is a deserving gift to all those who have supported my struggle. Thank you all for watching, and remember, the truth is never boring. It is, undoubtedly, highly compelling.